slowly along and seemed about to go by, only one little yard out of reach, it seemed as if my heart stood still. And when it was exactly abreast him and began to widen away, and he still standing like a watching statue, I knew my heart did stop. But when he gave a great spring the next instant and lit fairly in the stern, I discharged a war whoop that woke the solitudes. But it dulled my enthusiasm presently when he told me he had not been caring whether the boat came within jumping distance or not, so that it passed within eight or ten yards of him, for he had made up his mind to shut his eyes and mouth and swim that trifling distance. Imbecile that I was, I had not thought of that. It was only a long swim that could be fatal. The sea was running high and the storm increasing. It was growing late, too, three or four in the afternoon. Whether to venture toward the mainland or not was a question of some moment. But we were so distressed by thirst that we decided to try it. And so Higby fell to work and I took the steering oar. When we had pulled a mile laboriously, we were evidently in serious peril, for the storm had greatly augmented. The billows ran very high and were capped with foaming crests. The heavens were hung with black and the wind blew with great fury. We would have gone back now, but we did not dare to turn the boat around, because as soon as she got in the trough of the sea, she would upset, of course. Our only hope lay in keeping her head on to the seas. It was hard work to do this. She plunged so, and the beat and belabored, and so beat and belabored the billows with her rising and falling bows. Now and then one of Higby's oars would trip on the top of a wave and the other one would snatch the boat half around in spite of my cumbersome steering apparatus. We were drenched by the sprays constantly and the boat occasionally shipped water. By and by, powerful as my comrade was, his great exertions began to tell on him and he was anxious that I should change places with him till he could rest a little. But I told him that was impossible, for if the steering oar were dropped a moment while we changed, the boat would slew around into the trow of the sea, capsize, and in less than five minutes we would have a hundred gallons of soap suds in us and be eaten up so quickly that we could not even be present at our own inquest. But things cannot last always. Just as the darkness shut down, we came booming into port head on. Hing Higby dropped his oars to hurrah. I, dro I dropped mine to help. The sea gave the boat a twist, and over she went. The agony that alkali water inflicts on bruises, chafes, and blistered hands is unspeakable, and nothing but greasing all over will modify it. But we ate, drank, and slept well that night, notwithstanding. In speaking of the peculiarities of Mono Lake, I ought to have mentioned that at intervals all around us, shores stand picturesque, turret-looking masses and clusters of a whitish coarse-grained rock that resembles inters of a whitish inferior mortar dried hard and if one breaks off fragments of this rock he will find perfectly shaped and thoroughly petrified gull's eggs deeply imbibed in the mess in the mass how did they get there i simply state the fact <clears throat> Yes, indeed. For it is a fact, and leave the geologic, geological reader to 
crack the nut at his leisure or leisure and solve the problem after his own fashion. At the end of a week we adjourned to the Sierras on a fishing excursion and spent several days in camp under snowy Castle Peak and fished successfully for trout in a bright miniature lake whose surface was between 10 and 11,000 feet above the level of the sea cooling ourselves during the hot August noons by sitting on snow banks ten feet deep, under whose sheltering edges fine grass and dainty flowers flourished luxuriously, and at night entertaining ourselves by almost freezing to death. Then we returned to Mono Lake, and finding that the cement excitement was over for the present, packed up and went back to Esmeralda. Mr. Ballou reconnoitred a while and not liking the prospect, set out alone for Humboldt. About this time occurred a little incident which has always had a sort of interest to me, from the fact that it came so near instigating that's in quotes, my funeral. At a time when an Indian attack had been expected, the citizens hid their gunpowder where it would gunpowder, where it would be safe and yet convenient to hand when wanted. A neighbor of ours had six cans of rifle powder in the bake oven of an old discarded cooking stove which stood on the open ground near a frame outhouse or shed, and from and after that day never thought of it again. We hired a half-tamed Indian to do some washing for us, and he took up quarters under the shed with his tub. The ancient stove reposed within six feet of him and before his face. Finally it occurred to him that hot water would be better than cold, and he went out and fired up under that forgotten powder and he went out and fired up under that forgotten powder magazine and set on a kettle of water. Then he returned to his tub. I entered the shed presently and threw down some more clothes and was about to speak to him when the stove blew up with a prodigious crash and disappeared, leaving not a splinter behind. Fragments of it fell in the streets full 200 yards away. Nearly a third of the shed roof over our heads was destroyed, and one of the stove lids. After cutting a small stanchion half and two in front of the Indian, whizzed between us and drove partly through the weather boarding beyond. I was as white as a sheet and as weak as a kitten and speechless. But the Indian betrayed no trepidation no distress, not even discomfort. He simply stopped washing, leaned forward, and surveyed the clean, blank ground a moment, and then remarked, mm. Damn stove, hep, gone! And resumed his scrubbing as placidly as if it were an entirely customary thing for a stove to go to do. Different verb. I will explain that hep uh, engine English is engine English for very much. The reader will perceive the exhaustive expressiveness of it in the present instance. Chapter 40 the Wide West Mine. It is interviewed by Higby. A blind lead. Worth a million. We are rich at last. Plans for the future. I now come to a curious episode. The most curious, I think, that had yet accented my slothful 
valueless, heedless career. Out of a hillside toward the upper end of the town projected a wall of reddish-looking quartz croppings, the exposed comb of a silver-bearing ledge that extended deep down into the earth, of course. It was owned by a company entitled The Wide West. There was a shaft sixty or seventy feet deep on the underside of the croppings, and everybody was acquainted with the rock that came from it, and tolerably rich rock it was, too but nothing extraordinary. I will remark here that although to the inexperienced stranger, all the courts of a particular district looks about alike. An old resident of the camp can take a glance at a mixed pile of rock, separate the fragments and tell you which mine each came from, as easily as a confectioner can separate and classify the various kinds and qualities of candy in a mixed heap of the article. All at once the town was thrown into a state of extraordinary excitement. In mining parlance, the Wide West had struck it rich. Everybody went to see the new developments, and for some days there was such a crowd of people about the Wide West shaft that a stranger would have supposed there was a mass meeting in session there. No other topic was discussed but the rich strike, and nobody thought or dreamed about anything else. Every man brought away a specimen, grounded